How's it going guys? Jason Miller here from Five Weird Animal Facts and today we're going to be looking at all the bugs that I currently live with. All the arachnids, the invertebrates, I got some mantids, some scorpions, some tarantulas. We're going to look at all of them today and I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them. So uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Alright, first thing we're going to look at today is my collection of tarantulas. I have five different species at the moment and we're going to start off with... My big girl here. This is Lassiodora parahibana, a salmon pink bird eating tarantula. I prefer to just call these guys Brazilian salmon tarantulas or salmon pink tarantulas because they're not really true members of the bird eater family. Bird eating tarantulas are members of the genus Theraposa, where this one is a member of Lassiodora. Lassiodora parahibana is a really good species for someone who's kept tarantulas in the past and wants to move on to something that gets a little bit bigger. These guys can have a 9 inch leg span when full grown, which is pretty impressive. Brazilian salmon pink tarantulas are New World tarantulas. New World tarantulas being tarantulas found in North, South, and Central America. The biggest difference between New World tarantulas, like this one here, and Old World tarantulas, tarantulas found in Asia and Africa, are that uh, when the New World tarantulas are threatened, when there's something that looks like it's going to eat them, their first defense mechanism is actually to kick hairs. And uh, what I mean by that is those hairs on their abdomen right there are called urticating hairs and she'll actually use her back legs to kick those hairs out and they'll actually stick into your skin uh, into a predator's face and they'll be very itchy and uncomfortable. Old world tarantulas don't have urticating hairs so they can't kick hairs as a defense mechanism. So their first line of defense is to run away so old world tarantulas are usually very fast and their second line of defense is to bite. So usually their venom is a little bit more potent than you, the uh, tarantulas that you'd find in North and South America. This one's a little tinier, so she's gonna be a little harder to work with here. And she's at the very top. Come on, get down there, get down, get down there. There you go. All right, this is a green bottle blue tarantula, a Chromatopelma cyanopubescens. And this is one of the most beautiful tarantulas out there. Uh, when they're full grown, they have really striking orange abdomen and the rest of their body is like a complete blue. It's very, very beautiful. This is a very fast species. I'll try and see if I can get him to run down so you can have a better look. There you go, oh, there's that speed. This species loves to web up their enclosure and they almost always stay out in the open, which is really good. They're the perfect display tarantula. Uh, the reason there's no web in this one right now is because I just put him into this new enclosure today. This isn't really a species that I'd recommend handling too much because they are extremely fast and very nervous. While you're handling them, they could easily run out of your hand, jump onto the floor, and die. That being said, they're pretty easy to care for. They're an arid species, so they like it very dry. Uh, small water dish is all that's really necessary and uh, they take food no problem. These guys love to eat. They're not picky at all. They'll only stop eating when they're about to molt. I'm a little bit nervous about uh, opening the lid on this species because it is a very, very, very fast tarantula and a very small tarantula. It is a Colombian pumpkin patch tarantula of the genus Hapalopus. They have really, there you go. Very striking coloration. All right, that's as far as I'm gonna take them out. Very striking coloration, and what's unique about this species too is that they stay this color pattern from birth till death. With a lot of tarantula species, you're gonna get a very, very dull colored tarantula when it's, you know, in its first few molts, and then as it slowly reaches adulthood, you're gonna see brighter colors and its more permanent pattern. This guy looks almost identical as he did when I first got him, and he was about one fifth this size. This is another great display species, not really something that you should hold. Um, they are so so fast when I first brought that one home it actually got loose and chasing it around my room was not very fun it took me about an hour to get it back into its enclosure all right this is a Honduran curly hair tarantula Brachypelma albopisolum uh, this is one of the best beginner tarantula species because they reach a fairly manageable size only about probably this big uh, they tolerate handling very very well and they look very cool uh, the Honduran curly hairs get their name because they have very, very long hairs all over their body. And I'll throw up a picture here so you can see what they'll look like when they're full grown. This next one is my personal favorite. It's also the newest tarantula in my collection. It is a Goody Sapphire Ornamental Tarantula, or Postilatheria Metallica. This, a lot of people will say that it is the most beautiful tarantula in the world, and I'm one of those people that says that. They are stunning when they're full grown. Just unbelievable, beautiful purple and yellow coloration. 
I, I can't wait for this guy to get his color. Uh, I bought him from a friend of mine who said that the parents were very brightly colored and this individual already is showing a little bit of that purple. So I know that this is gonna be a beautiful animal when it's full grown. This is more of an expert species. People who've been uh, taking care of tarantulas for a good amount of time and have experience with multiple different species. Uh, fast species, species with a lot of venom, because this is kind of all of that combined. They are lightning quick. They like teleport from place to place and uh, their venom is pretty significant. Uh, probably one of the most venomous tarantulas in the world. It still wouldn't kill me. There's no really such thing as a deadly tarantula. There's just tarantulas that could cause allergic reactions that could result in death. But this would be one of the most painful, painful, painful bites of any tarantula out there. And I was so psyched to bring this guy home from the New England Reptile Expo last weekend because it's a species that I've always loved and I've always wanted to work with. So I really, really look forward to growing this guy up and seeing those beautiful, beautiful colors when he reaches his full size. So that's about all I got for tarantulas. Now let's move on to the true spiders. I currently have two animals that can be classified as true spiders. One of them is over a year old now uh, and I've actually had it since it was a little baby. It is a Western Black Widow Spider, Laterodectus Hesperus. Let me see if I can get her a little more out in the open. Uh, I bred some Western Black Widow Spiders last year, and this is actually the only baby that I have left. I, I sold the others. But Black Widows are really cool because they're just pet rocks, really. They don't do a whole lot. They just kind of make their big, um, very complex looking cobweb, and then eat until they're full grown and then stop eating when they've reached sexual maturity and just wait to have sex and die. It's a pretty exciting life. When you think black widow spider, you're probably thinking a very deadly dangerous species. But the truth is there hasn't been a death from a Western black widow since the 50s. And uh, the reason behind that is because of medical advancements since then. And also it's just very rare to be bit by one of these. They have a really bad reputation but in reality, the only time people get bit is when they accidentally uh, put their hands near a black widow female who's guarding her eggs. But like I said, these guys are not deadly. A uh, healthy adult should have nothing to worry about. If they get bit, it's going to be very painful and it results in severe abdominal cramping uh, for as long as 48 hours. But not death. Unless you're allergic. Again, with every animal I say, the venom is a certain does this and this. If you're allergic, it's different. Here, let me do something real stupid for a second. Please, please don't try this at home. Don't, I'm just trying to prove, prove a point about their aggression when they're uh, not taking care of their kids. But if I just kind of wiggle my finger right next to her on the web, she doesn't even care. Messing with her stuff. Give her a little poke. I got nothing to worry about. Let's move on now to another species, one that I definitely will not put my fingers in the cage of. Because if I do, that might be the end of five weird animal facts. These two are six-eyed sand spiders. This is an adult and this is a little baby. So the effects of six-eyed sand spider venom on humans is, isn't 100% uh, known just because nobody's ever been killed by one. But lab tests in mice have shown that their venom is strong enough where it could be potentially deadly if a human was to be bitten by one. They'll lie themselves very flat against the sand and then they'll actually cover themselves in sand. That's why they're called sand spiders. Covering themselves in sand is fantastic camouflage. It's what they do all day. They just kind of sit in the sand and chill out. And then when night rolls around, they unbury themselves and go out hunting for food. This is a very, very fast species. So watching them hunt, I bet would be a lot of fun. Look at that. Let me put it back, there we go. This is a species that needs zero humidity its entire life. It just lives in sand and gets all the water that it needs from its prey. Uh, so very easy to care for, kind of like the Black Widow, it's just a pet rock. But I don't recommend it to anybody unless they have a pretty good experience with venomous spiders because, like I said, it's a potentially deadly species. So don't mess with it unless you know what you're doing. All right, so that's it for true spiders. Now let's move on from that to scorpions. So scorpion number one is an Asian forest scorpion. And this is a uh, species that is very similar to the emperor scorpion, which was for a long time the most popular scorpion in the hobby. Uh, but import on the emperor scorpion has actually been banned. So right now, emperor scorpions are a bit more expensive and these guys have kind of taken the forefront as the most popular pet 
scorpion species. And they look very similar to emperor scorpions. They don't get quite as big. You're looking at an adult right here. Uh, this venom on this species is not bad at all. It's like a bee sting. Uh, the claws probably hurt just as much. One way you can tell whether or not a scorpion is uh, very dangerous is the size of the claws in relation to the size of the tail. If the tail is very thick and the claws are very thin, you're probably looking at a very venomous species because they don't need all that claw strength in order to um, kill their prey. If the tail is very thin and the claws are very thick, like this species, you're probably looking at something that's not going to do you too much damage. The thing I love most about scorpions in general is the fact that their uh, exoskeleton glows under black light. I think I showed this off in my Africa video. And one of my favorite things to do when I was in South Africa was at night, I'd go outside with a black light and uh, look for scorpions. They have sensory hairs on their pedipalps, their claws, and uh, that's one way that they sense prey. And uh, when they do sense prey, they grab it with those claws. If it's really big prey, they'll also use the stinger to immobilize it. If it's smaller prey, they'll just use their claws and eat it straight up like that. So we'll carefully put him back. Putting, putting them back is almost the hard part. Ooh, that was close. All right, scorpion number two is Pandanus cabamanus. I might not be saying that correctly, but who cares? It is the Tanzanian red claw scorpion. This one is a little bit aggressive, so I'm not gonna take him out. But I will kind of disrupt his cave so you can see him. This is a more of a burrowing species, so I keep a hide in there to make sure that he's always covered. Uh, they will come out at night to hunt and drink. Uh, the sting on this guy is a little bit more potent than the Asian forest scorpion. It's going to hurt a little bit more. Still, doesn't warrant a hospital visit. It's just going to suck a little bit. Both of those scorpions were pretty plain looking. They're just black, right? This is much better. This is, I think, my uh, favorite scorpion that I own. This is a Florida bark scorpion, Centroroidus gracilis. Uh, this one just molted yesterday, actually, so the color is a little bit more vibrant than they'd usually be. Very long tail on this guy, pretty thick tail, very thin claws. Their venom is a little bit more potent, uh, still not deadly, but this will be a very painful sting. Uh, relatively small species, this isn't full grown. It's gonna get probably tw uh, three times this size. But what I love about these guys is that awesome coloration that they have. Really, really beautiful animal. Found right in Florida, so they need a little higher humidity and a bit warmer temperatures. Uh, I actually had two of these originally because they're supposed to be a communal species. They're supposed to be able to live together. But uh, I came down here one day and I saw one very fat Florida bark scorpion and one missing Florida bark scorpion. So this guy decided to eat his brother. I'll be honest, I have never held this scorpion before, but just for you guys, I'm going to try it out. Boom, look at that. God, he's beautiful. Very non-aggressive. I expected uh, a little bit more aggression from this one, but he's being very, very chill. All right, that's all I got for arachnids. Now let's move on to insects, which personally I'm a bit of a bigger fan of. We'll start off with these guys right here. These are very small, so they're not going to look too impressive. Cockroaches, until they reach their full size, all look pretty much the same. Uh, these are orange head cockroach nymphs. Nymphs meaning babies. This is a species that cannot climb glass, so they make a great pet. And they also look really cool and really exotic when they're full grown. I'll throw up a picture. So I got three of those. I'm going to go through these ones quick. Next, these are really, really cool. This is probably the most beautiful cockroach I have. These are question mark roaches, Theria olegrangini. And uh, they look more like exotic beetles than they do cockroaches. They're just so beautiful with that strange pattern. One thing that's kind of special about this species uh, is that they do need a lot of leaf litter because they'll actually chew on those decaying leaves and that takes up a good portion of their diet as well as rotting greens and fruits and veggies. My personal favorite is the giant cave cockroach, Blabberus giganteus. And uh, it's called that because it's really freaking big. These guys are make great pets. They're very, uh, very relaxed. They don't mind handling that much. And uh, this is another one that cannot climb glass. So it's really good if you have a terrarium that you're worried about, you know, breeding them and then the babies all escaping and infesting your house. They can't do that. All right, this guy was a big hit in my last room tour video. 
It is the grub of an Eastern Hercules beetle. So he has changed in shape a little bit. Uh, he is looking like he's getting closer and closer to pupating. Um, still, it's months after he was expected to pupate. So it's a little frustrating when you buy something at an expo and someone tells you uh, this animal is going to metamorphose in three months and almost a year later it's still a gross ass grub. Uh, I'm not complaining though, it's very easy to take care of. I just have it in a jar of dirt and compost and some rotting wood. And, um, and that's where it lives. So I basically have a jar of dirt until this guy decides to turn into a beetle. All right, now I'm gonna show you guys uh, the newest insects that I've really gotten into recently and I'm quickly becoming obsessed with them. Stick insects. These are anam stick insects, Metaroidae extradentata, and I can actually take one out because they're pretty chill. This species eats oak leaves and bramble, um, some hazel, and during the winter when none of those are available outside, I feed them kale, and they love kale. It's the only uh, leaf that I've given them that isn't really part of their natural diet that they've taken, and I don't like the fact that I have to give them something that's outside of what they're naturally supposed to eat, but at the same time, uh, nothing else is available. You know, everything, I, we're in New Hampshire, so the snow prevents me from going outside and picking oak leaves, which I do when it's warmer out. So I give them their natural diet then. But let me just grab you. I know, sweetie, I'm sorry. Something that's really cool about uh, this species and a number of other species of stick insect is that all of them are females, in captivity especially they are parthenogenic, which means that the females lay eggs without being fertilized by the males. And uh, what that does is allows faster reproduction, but it also prevents evolution from occurring. Um, there are no mutations in the gene pool because they are all genetic copies of their mother. So when this one lays her eggs, which she should, hopefully soon, everything that hatches out is going to be an exact genetic copy of her. There are very few animals that practice parthenogenesis just for that very reason, is it, uh, it prevents the species from moving forward. These are nocturnal, so during the day they'll just kind of hang out and stay completely still outside on their um, preferred plant of food. And then at night they'll start moving around a little bit more, looking for food and uh, chomping on some leaves. And there's a bit of a worry in North America especially with stick insects as being an invasive species. They are invasive in some states. New Hampshire, it's not a big deal. If somehow this female did get out, lay a bunch of eggs, they're not gonna last too long. New Hampshire is just too damn cold for this species. And uh, it, for one little cold snap, as soon as it gets under 70 degrees, they're gonna die. That being said, importing them into the country is illegal. Um, and uh, I believe for some states, crossing state lines with them is also illegal. But I bought, the, I bought these in New Hampshire. Uh, they've been captive bred for many generations, so I'm not too worried about it. They're just so cool, man. I, I, like I said, I'm becoming obsessed with stick insects. So I'm gonna have to try and find some more, I think. I have four of them, and uh, they like a good amount of ventilation, and they don't need really, really high humidity. I just kind of spray their leaves down every time they, um, they eat. They also get a little drink. And they also have a um, little place for the adult females to lay their eggs. A little bit of dirt here. So that's the anomstic insect. And these are giant thorny stick insects. Tracheuritoin bruichneri. These guys are a little bit easier because they can survive off of a diet of uh, ivy as well. So you can see the ivy has a lot of bite marks on it. I have some kale in there for them also, just to give them some variation. But these I just got recently. Same thing, captive bred for many generations, bought in the state of New Hampshire, so I'm good legally. <laughs> and uh, they're very small right now. They'll get about five inches long when they're full grown. Uh, so they don't get as long as the anomstic insects, but they get much thicker. They are very bulky. Um, they're a very, very chill animal. They're just gonna pretty much do this all day, stand completely still, and at night, they slowly, slowly move around on their um, food plants and chew on the leaves. 
This species needs a little bit more humidity, which is why I have them in a um, critter keeper that has plastic sides, so there's less ventilation and it keeps in more moisture. And uh, the way that I keep the plants alive with my stick insects while they're eating them is I put little cups of water and I uh, put holes in the lids for the stems to go through and that can quadruple the lifespan of the plants that are in their enclosure as they're being eaten. The males of this species have that really cool lighter stripe on their back while the females, let me see if I can grab one out, don't have that stripe and the females are also going to get a little significantly bigger actually. And uh, this species is not parthenogenic. They require a male and female to reproduce. And what's, uh, it's really funny because when they reach their full size, what happens is the females will walk around and the males will climb onto her back. And uh, they will be a mated pair and the females will just walk around for days and days and days with the male just riding on her back. Um, not even when they're mating. When they're mating, obviously, he's on her back too, but... You know, she'll be eating, she'll be sleeping, and he'll just kind of be hitching a ride. So uh, I can't wait to see that because that's going to be very cool to watch. But look at how beautiful this animal is, man. They're so bizarre. I don't know if you knew this about me, but I like really weird stuff, and uh, this definitely counts as a weird animal in my book. So the last insects that we're going to be looking at today are my absolute favorites, the praying mantises. So first of all, Let's get my favorite species over here. These are ghost mantids. How cool is that? God, man, they're so weird. They're so weird. Phylocrania paradoxa. Just looks just like a dead leaf. It's unbelievable, this species. Uh, this one is bright green. Where is this one? Let me get him out, let me get him out. I have three of these. I have a... Uh, Two that look more like this, which are a little smaller, brown ones, and uh, the one green one. You freaking be- don't! <laughs> and I was gonna say these guys are actually a communal species, so you can house multiple of uh, them together, but this one seems to disagree with me. What's unique and special about this species is that really cool big appendage coming out of their head, which adds to their camouflage of looking like a dead leaf. And uh, their entire body is meant to just look like leaf litter. So they camouflage in very, very well. Uh, they need a bit higher humidity when they're younger. Uh, as they get older, you can keep the humidity down a little bit, or you can keep it up. They're not very specific about their humidity needs. I like to keep the humidity up because I've noticed that it makes their coloration a lot more um, bright. The uh, green one, I've kept very humid its entire life, and I think that's kind of why it's got that green color. I've heard rumors on the internet that say that Phylocrania paradox uh, will turn green if their environment is left humid enough. And uh, since I've gotten this one and its sibling, it's gotten a lot lighter in color as well, so I'm thinking that is probably true. What I love about mantids more than anything is how freaking intelligent they are for a bug. Like, I'm just kind of like putting my finger around here and he's watching my every single move. This is the only invertebrate that I've ever kept that when you look at it, it looks right back at you and is trying to figure out what you are and what you want the same way that I'm looking at him and trying to study him. He's looking at me and trying to study me. And I think that's really, really special. This is an African twig mantis, Popa spurca. Here is a smaller one. You can tell why they're called twig mantids. He blends right in with that twig. This is a really good beginner species of mantis because they require zero humidity. Uh, all the moisture that they get, they get from their food, uh, which is crickets mostly. These guys will eat crickets. When they're younger, they'll eat fruit flies and uh, pinhead crickets. But at this size, he's already eating adult crickets. And look at that camouflage. If you walk past, a tree with a bunch of branches like this and saw this, you wouldn't even notice that it was an insect. Really incredible. So that's what a smaller one looks like. Uh, I think this one has about two more molts to go and then it's gonna reach its full size. And when it does, it'll look like this. All right, and here's another one of my favorite species. You'll probably hear me say that a lot. Hyrodula membranacea. And, uh, 
Got these guys from Treetop Reptile. Check them out, really awesome mantis breeder. But here he is. And the reason that I'm showing you all three of these is because they are very different. They're all the same exact species, Hyrogula membranacea, but they're different color morphs. It's a lot like ball pythons. They have different morphs and different color patterns. This is a purple morph, or I think they're called purple phase. They're not really morphs, technically. But uh, <laughs> not nearly full grown. He'll reach, oh man, over five inches. I know that, five or six inches. They're massive. Their uh, common name is giant Asian mantis because they are giant when they're full grown and really, really fun to care for. So this one is a beautiful purple color. This one I just got recently and he's still a little baby. It's the golden Hyrogula membranacea. So he's really goldish yellow color, which is very beautiful. I can't wait for him to get full grown. And this one is a blue phase Hyrogula membranacea. Beautiful. This is a little closer to what they normally look like in the wild, that uh, greenish blue color. That is usually much more green, but because this is a blue phase, it's going to be more aqua color. And I can't wait for this one to get bigger because it's going to look really, really pretty. And um, I'll be able to, depending on which one of these are males and which ones are females, I'll be able to mix and mash and uh, create some really cool looking babies. Because I'm really interested in finding out how that works genetically as far as what colors are passed on, if the mother is a purple and the father is a blue or the mother is a golden and the father is a purple. Uh, what ratio do those babies come out in? Uh, so that'll be really fun to, fun to play around with as far as breeding them is concerned. And uh, they're just a really beautiful species. The fact that they come in so many different colors, but they're all still the same species, same locality, is very, very cool. So this is one of the newest species I got as well. This is a violin mantis. This I'm super excited about because it's a species that I've always wanted to care for. Uh, they're so bizarre looking. They're so skinny. These guys are built to uh, eat prey that flies. So I have a bunch of fruit flies for him when he's this size. And I have some larvae for uh, blue bottle flies when he reaches adulthood. And I'll try to get him to eat crickets as well just because it'll be a lot easier uh, to obtain crickets than flies. Uh, they need very, very dry uh, space and they also need it to be very, very hot. In order to reproduce, they need temperatures of around 100 degrees, and uh, normally they just like between 85 and 90 degree temperatures. So you'll need a heat lamp or a heat pad for this species, but uh, totally worth it because they're so bizarre looking, and they're really, really cool. They have awesome personality. All right, these next three are super tiny, so I'm just gonna keep the vials all up here. This is a South American deadleaf mantis. Uh, South American deadleaf mantis obviously gets its name because it looks like a big dead leaf. They like very high humidity and um, man, that's about it. This is beautiful. This is a Indian flower mantis. This is a very small species, but a very, very beautiful species. These guys like fairly high humidity. It uh, just, you know, aids in their molting and also kind of reflects their natural habitat a little bit better. And the ones that are all in these vials are all currently eating fruit flies right now just because of their size. This one is a thistle mantis. Right now it actually looks very similar to the Indian flower mantis. The difference being that they like it bone dry and very hot as well. Uh, and this is still a small one. It'll get about three inches when it's full grown. Um, but right now, yeah, this is about an L3. So it's molted three times uh, since it was born. So it's still very, very tiny. I think it's the smallest mantis that I have right now, but uh, still beautiful. And I can't wait to see it reach its full size because this is another really, really pretty mantis. So this is something I didn't expect to show you today. Uh, I actually walked in on my Chinese mantid Uthica. Uthica are egg cases. I have two of them right now, except one of them hatched right as I was setting up my camera. So I actually stopped what I was doing and filmed the Uthika hatching, and all of these babies came out. There are probably a little over a hundred individual baby Chinese mantids in here, and there's still a full egg case that's waiting to hatch. So we're probably looking at closer to two to three hundred baby uh, Chinese mantids when all of them are out. 
the uh, this is a species that will become cannibalistic. So after they molt once, I'm gonna have to separate them, and I have a bunch of vials that'll do that. I purchased the um, egg cases, the Uthica online, and uh, from there I set them up, they incubated, and they hatched. And I was like, I, it blew my mind watching it because it's just so strange and so beautiful at the same time. They kind of come out of the egg sac as these little worm looking things and they come down on these strands of silk and they're all attached together and then they start to slowly move. They unfurl their legs and they start crawling out of the egg sac and over each other. This was very fun for me to film so check out this footage. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this part two of my animal room tour. Uh, I love my invertebrates. I love my bugs. It's a bit odd, but it's all I know. Uh, I, I don't remember a time when I wasn't very fascinated by insects. And that fascination has just grown and grown the older I've gotten. And now it's kind of turned into an obsession. So I hopefully will be able to show you a lot more of these guys and other insects and arachnids in uh, future shows. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys, uh, subscribe to Animal Bites TV, check me out on all my social media crap, and uh, until next time, my name is Jason Miller, and I'll see you next Monday on 5 Weird Animal Facts.